Okay, so tonight we're going to begin by discussing, we're going to go backwards a little bit. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Abraham, our father in faith. But before we talk about Abraham, we have to talk about Abram. And before we talk about Abram, we have to see how the narrative in Genesis 1 through 11 prepares us for Genesis 12, when Abram comes on to the scene. He actually comes on to the scene in the end of chapter 11, but he'll really be on the scene in chapter 12. So, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are almost kind of like a preface or an introduction to what's going to, to really begin, really get going with Abraham, our father in faith. And so we have these different genealogies in Genesis 1 through 11. We begin with Adam, and we see that through Adam, Adam fathers Cain, who's the firstborn, but Cain does not get the blessing of the firstborn, the blessing that the father gives to the son. Rather, he sins. He murders his brother Abel, and the other son who's given is the son Seth, and Seth retains the blessing. Okay, so we see genealogies going down from Seth, and from Adam we have ten generations uh, through Seth. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then the tenth generation is in Noah. And so the narrative continues through Noah, and Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is the firstborn. Shem does not forfeit the, first, the, the blessing of the firstborn, the firstborn, but we do see a particular curse given through Ham to Canaan in Genesis 9. Now, through Shem, Noah, going through Shem from Noah, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then the 10th generation is with Terah. And Terah has three sons, and his firstborn is going to be Abram. Abram. And all throughout Genesis, Shem and Abram are the only two firstborn sons not to forfeit the blessing that's given to them. Uh, we'll see with Jacob and Esau, Esau is the firstborn, but Jacob gets the blessing because Esau sells his birthright for a, for a cup of porridge. For a bowl of porridge, he's so hungry. We'll we'll find out uh, next week when we when we get into the patri the rest of the patriarchs. Patriarchs means order of fathers, patris arche, the order of fathers. So these are our fathers in faith. And so Genesis one through eleven brings us to Abram. And right before Abram, we have in Genesis eleven we have the Tower of Babel. And in the Tower of Babel, we see God uh, disuniting humanity by confusing their languages when they try and build this Tower of Babel. Now, the, dis the people who built the Tower of Babel were the descendants of Ham. The Hamite king Nimrod went to the land of Shinar, and then they built this tower, okay, which you could be likened to. It could actually be one of these ziggurats from, you know, in the Middle East, and your textbook shows one of those. And so we have this line through Ham trying to make a shim for themselves, trying to make a name for themselves. And I want to introduce you, if I haven't already, and I, did, I believe I did mention this in a previous session, is the Book of Jubilees. And the Book of Jubilees is intertestamental literature. Okay, so it's, it's between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not a part of Scripture. It's not divinely inspired. But it is a commentary on the book of Genesis, a Jewish commentary. And so if we want to see how Jews read this narrative, a, a great way to go is, is to the book of Jubilees. And, of course, there's no copyright, so you can find it online. You can, uh, there, you can just do a Google search for Jubilees. 
And Jubilees gives us some of the, some of the interpretive clues for uh, Genesis 1 through 11. And one of the things that Jubilees talks about is how Ham was trying to kind of, uh, basically, you remember he uncovered the nakedness of Noah. And we saw from Leviticus 18 that to uncover the nakedness of your father was, what, was it basically it says, do not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. And so this term, uncovering nakedness, uh, implies maternal incest, uncovering the nakedness of your father. And so we see in this intertestamental literature that just as Ham, the reason that Ham did this, that he uncovered the nakedness of his father, and then possibly the fruit of that maternal incest is Canaan, and Ham did this in order to assert his authority, to try and get the birthright, uh, just as Absalom did this to his father David in Jerusalem. Absalom uh, kicked his father David out of Jerusalem and slept with the concubines. And this was to say, hey, look, I'm now the king. I'm, I'm like, going to have a coup, like what's going on in Thailand right now, you know, to make this kind of contemporary. And so he did this to, to get the name, to get the blessing, to get the power. Uh, but Noah, in response to this, blesses Shem by saying, you know, blessed is the God of Shem. And then he curses Canaan. So we have curse and bless, we have blessing and cursing. And this is in Genesis 9. And this will, again, the reason I'm telling you this is because this will lead as an introduction into what we see in the, in the narrative of Abram. And so Jubilees talks about how Ham, as Ham did this to Noah, as he tried to uh, basically usurp Noah's authority as the, as the father figure, so Canaan did this to Seth by settling in the land that was rightfully Seth's, which is the land of Canaan. Okay? So the land of Canaan, let's say here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's, here's the Jordan River. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say Seth? Okay, thank you. Scratch that. Uh, the land of Shem. Thank you the correction. It just proves I'm not infallible. Um, so we have the Sea of Galilee. It goes down to the Dead Sea down here. We have the Great Sea, as it's referred to in the Bible, or the Mediterranean. And I know the uh, Rex Roads are very familiar with this territory after that cruise, which uh, next year they're going to give to me because they, they're going to like this Bible study so much. And so this land of Canaan we're told in Jubilees, is rightfully the land of Shem, not the land of Seth. Okay? And so we're going to see Abram starting on this pilgrimage to the land of Canaan. And later on we'll see Abram's descendants taking over the land of Canaan. And Jubilees says this is right because, hey, this is, this is Shem's property. This is what he deserves. This is not Canaan's. Canaan usurped Shem's property just as Ham tried to usurp Noah's authority in Genesis 9. Do we know how that happened? I mean, how did Canaan get it from Shem? How did he get it? I don't know. I, mean, I think he ran out, I think he ran out there and he... I, yeah. I guess he put a stake out first. I guess it was like, um, what's that movie where they're Irish and has Tom Cruise in it? Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Was it called? Far and Away. Far and Away. Yeah, it's like Far and Away, I guess. You know, they ran out there, but Canaan tripped, you know, Tom Cruise and got there first and put his, put his flag in the land. And so let's turn to Genesis 12. And let's start reading the Genesis narrative. And be, but before we begin reading the narrative, go ahead and turn there, is to note, to note that what God is trying to do from the time of Adam is that God wants to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. God wants to reunite the human family. And so, guess what? The human family is being reunited under Nimrod, Ham's descendant. The Tower of Babel, humanity is coming together, speaking the same language, building a tower, you know, so God should be happy about this, right? 
Well, no, God wants unity, but he doesn't want unity born out of violence or political motives or, you know, barbaric power. This isn't the type of unity that God desires. God rather desires unity through humility, unity through the covenant. Okay, God, he, he wants unity on his terms, not on man's terms. And so we're going to see, we see humanity trying to go its own way, making a name for itself. And then we see God uniting humanity through Adam, through Seth, through Noah, through Shem, through Terah, through Abram, and then later through Isaac, then through Jacob, then through Judah, and all the way down through Joseph and Mary into Jesus. And this is how God's going to reunite the human family. And so, okay, let's go ahead and turn to the narrative in Genesis chapter 12. And where did God uh, call Abram from? Ur of the Chaldeans? No. No. Actually not. That's, that's what I thought at first. I was reading something and, and I said, oh, he called him out of, out of Ur. Now it does say that Terah, in verse 31 of chapter 11, it says that Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and brought them out of Ur the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Okay, so, so Terah was the one who brought Abram out of Ur. But God didn't call Abram out of Ur. God called Abram out of Haran. And in your book, where is it? I believe it's like around page 77, or maybe that was last week. We were looking on page 77. But we'll see the, the journey, the map, of where Abram traveled. Page 89, thank you. Page 89 in your books, you'll see the map. And you'll see how, how Abram comes from Ur, which is in Mesopotamia, around modern-day Iraq, goes through Babylon, uh, goes up, and he's in Haran, is where God calls him out of. And so Haran is way in the northeast. It's in Assyria, when in, in the day of, of Israel, when Israel was, was in the land, this would be the, empire, the Assyrian Empire, Haran. And so God calls him out. And we, we see in chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now God doesn't say, you know, he, he says I, the land I will show you, but he doesn't give the coordinates. He just says to a land that I'll show you. And then he, he makes a promise. He make, God makes a threefold promise. And I'm sure you're already well aware of what this threefold promise is if you've read the chapter. But I'm going to go ahead and write them up here. The first promise is he says, I will make of you, well, he says, go, go to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. So he says, go to this land and I will make of you a nation. Excuse me, a nation. And so this is the first promise. The second promise is, I will make your shim great. Or in other words, I will make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. Okay? And this is a Hebrew idiom, just like to uncover the nakedness of your father is an idiom for maternal incest. So, I will make a shim for you is like saying, I'm going to make a kingdom for you. I'm going to make a dynasty for you. Okay, it's like how we would say the house of Bourbon or the house of Habsburg, you know, or the house of David. This is a, this is a Hebrew idiom. I'm going to make a name for you. So this is the promise of a kingdom. We'll, and we'll see more about this in Genesis 17. Okay, and then he, interestingly, interestingly, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So we see... Cursing and blessing. And, you know, not necessarily in that order. And this is kind of a, a literary clue. The author is saying, hey, when was the last time that there was cursing and blessing? Back with Shem, right? God blessed Shem and cursed Canaan. And in the same passage, we have him saying, I will make your Shem great. Okay, I will make your shim great. 
I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It's like a literary clue. He's kind of alluding back to Genesis 9, and he's saying, what, what's, what basically, what I'm doing is I'm, what I wanted to do through Shem is what I'm now doing through you. You're, uh, you're through Shem's line, and I'm going to continue this, this, uh, this covenant. I'm going to continue this divine plan of salvation through Shem, through you. All the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. Now, this is huge because all the communities of the earth, not just the Arameans and just the Israelites or just the Edomites and just the Israelites or just the Israelites and just the Babylonians, but no, all of the, all of the, the families, all of the communities, all of the nations. So this is going to be worldwide blessing. And another way of saying worldwide is Catholic. Remember, Catholic comes from the two Greek words, kata holos, according to the whole, all-encompassing. And so in the Catholic Church, we, God's salvation is blessing doesn't come to just those who are of Israel by the flesh, but rather anybody and everybody from any nation worldwide can become a part of God's family. And so we'll see that the concept of Catholicity goes all the way back to Genesis 12, verse 3. Okay, let's go ahead and continue here. Abram went as the Lord directed him. This is in verse 4. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Aram. I'm, I'm sorry, Haran. Okay, so Abram was 75. Now what I'm going to do right now is, is I'm going to go backwards again a little bit, and I'm going to set you up, because the author has set us up in a good way. This is a good setup. And let's turn back a little bit to chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11, verse 10. And we'll see that we have another Toledoth another genealogical line. This is the record of the Toledoth, or of the descendants, of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arpachshad, two years after the flood. Shem lived 500 years after the birth of Arpachshad, and he had other sons and daughters. Okay, so... Here's Shem, and Shem lived how long after the birth of Arpachshad? 500 years. 500 years. So let's go ahead and, and count this up. Now, numbers are important to Hebrews. Numbers don't, are, are never just given there just arbitrarily. You know? the, 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 there's, gonna, there's, some, there's literary clues here, and we're going to look those up. Now, I put this A here with the period after it. Uh, to abbreviate our Pakshad, because we're going to be going through some names here that are going to be a little, uh, a little difficult. So, uh, Barbara, would you please keep reading, uh, beginning with verse 12. When our Pakshad was 35 years old, he became the father of Shelah. Our Pakshad lived 403 years after the birth of Shelah, and he had other sons and daughters. When Sheila was 30 years old, he became the father of Eber. 30. Sheila lived 403 years after the birth of Eber, and he had other sons and daughters. When Eber was 34 years old, he became the father of Pele. Eber lived 430 years after the birth of Pele, and he had other sons and daughters. When Pele was 30 years old, he became the father of Roy. Peleg lived 209 years after the birth of Roy, and he had other sons and daughters. When Roy was 32 years old, he became the father of Sarah. Roy lived 207 years after the birth of Sarah, and he had other sons and daughters. When Sarah was 30 years old, he became the father of Nahor. Sarah lived 200 years after the birth of Nahor, and he had other sons and daughters. When Nahor was 29 years old, he became the father of Terah. 
Nair lived 119 years after the birth of Terah, and he had other sons and daughters. When Terah was 70 years old, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay, thank you so much, Barbara. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying that, that what we're doing is we're counting up the years here, beginning with our Pakshad's birth. And here in Abram was born, and the narrative picks up when Abram is 75 years old, right? Okay, let's go ahead and add these up here. We have 5 plus 9 is 14, that's 16, that's 25. We'll carry the 2. We'll have 5, that's 8, that's 11, that's 14, that's 17, 29, 36. 365 years have passed since the birth of our Pakshad, right? And Shem lives 500 years after the birth of our Pakshad, right? So Shem, by the time the narrative picks up in Genesis 12, has another 135 years of life left. In fact, Abram lives another 100 years. Abraham dies at the age of 175. So, since he has another 100 years to live, Shem actually outlives Abraham by 35 years. And being, back then, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you maybe kind of forgot who your grandfather was because maybe you had a divorce in the family and, you know, you... You, you moved on and you moved to another country or something. No, back then, families were tight-knit. And do you think Abram would know who his... Oh, my gosh, there's father... Great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather is? Yeah, certainly. And who was the last person to receive the blessing? Shem, right? Well, let's skip forward a little bit, and we'll go to Genesis 14... Genesis 14, verse 18. And we have this really weird pericope. A pericope is like a section of scripture. Okay? And it's about this, this mysterious character named Melchizedek. Now, Mel Melchizedek in chapter 14, verse 18, is shown uh, in the midst of these battles between these kings and, and, Abra and Abram and these kings. And... So we have Melchizedek. And Melchizedek's name means what? Melchi. It's a deck. Melchi means king. And stek means righteousness. Or, just, or you know, one who has justice. King of righteousness. And who is Melchizedek king of? Who's his kingdom? Salem. So he's the king of Salem. And Salem comes from the same root as Shalom, which means, what you, if you're Jewish and you say Shalom, what are you saying? Peace. Okay? So it's like Pax Christi, peace of Christ. Well, we say Shalom Christi. Okay, or Shalom, peace of the Messiah, Shalom Mashiach. There you go. Okay, so we have, so he's the king of peace. Do you guys ever remember one of, the, one of these titles of Jesus? He's the prince of peace. I will live my life for you. You guys listen to, uh, um, uh, who, 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 who authored Prince of Peace? Okay, you guys don't know. Okay, so we have this king of righteousness who's the king of Salem. And by the way, guess where Jerusalem gets its name from? Jewish tradition has it that Melchizedek was king of what later would become Jerusalem. Okay? And uh, Melchizedek blesses Abram with what? What are the gifts he blesses him with? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. And is Melchizedek from the line of Levi, the son of Israel? The son of Israel. So is Melchizedek a Levitical priest from Levi? No, Levi hadn't even been born yet. Israel hadn't even been born yet. I mean, so in the time of Jesus, 
to be a priest, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. You had to be a Levitical priest. But the New Testament says that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek who was without number of days. Now, some people interpret that as saying, okay, well, Melchizedek just appears on the scene and then he disappears. It must be like he was never born or he never died, and that's what Jesus is like. No, that's not what, the, that's not what Hebrews means when it says that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Rather, Melchizedek is a priest, and he gets his priesthood from being the firstborn son, okay, by being the son of, who is Shem the son of? Noah. Noah. He doesn't get his priesthood from being a Levite. And we'll notice that Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi, but he's from the tribe of Judah. So how can Jesus be a priest, the Pharisees say, or the Jews say? How could Jesus be a priest if he's not from the tribe of Levi? We'll learn later on that the Levitical priesthood was not, it it didn't come from the beginning. The Levitical priesthood was kind of like putting a, a patch or a bandage on a wound. And the Levitical priesthood is done away with, with Jesus. But we'll see more about that later. But I'm just bringing this up so that later on when we talk about the Levitical priesthood, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. And that when the book of Hebrews says that Melchizedek was without number of days, what it means is that in order to be a Levitical priest, you had to prove your lineage all the way back to Levi. You had to prove you know, your birthright all the way back to Levi. Well, Melchizedek doesn't have a birthright going back to Levi. In fact, he, he's much older than Levi. His Levi doesn't even exist yet. And so that's what the author of Hebrews means. And so here we have a great foreshadowing of Jesus. We have the king of righteousness, who's the king of the earthly Jerusalem, which means peace. And he blesses Abram's family with bread and wine. And in the, in the new covenant, we'll see the king of righteousness, who's the king of the heavenly Jerusalem, who blesses his family with gifts of the Eucharist. Okay? Bread and wine become his very own body and blood. And in this, in the, so let's see this narrative. We have, uh, Blessed be Abra, Abram by God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivers your foes into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Okay, so I just wanted to bring this up because this is a very important passage. And get this, uh, the earliest Jewish commentaries on scripture in the Targums and Midrash, uh, St. Augustine, um, St. Jerome, even Martin Luther, knew that Melchizedek is Shem. This is common knowledge. I think the Book of, I think the book of Jubilee states it as well. Not sure, but I would, I, would, I would not bet the house on it, but I would bet five bucks. Now, nobody bet me, please. Because that five that five dollars can really multiply here, okay? And so that that's this is just a really cool little biblical insight that kind of c- it continues the narrative. It shows how uh, Abram is here to continue the the covenant blessing. Now, now we're going to get into a really oh by the way, Melchizedek is both a king and a priest, and Jesus as Messiah is not just our high priest. And he's not just our king, but he's both king and priest. He's a royal priest, a royal priest, or a priestly king, which uh, which Melchizedek really foreshadows Christ. Yes. Did you say uh, Melchizedek was Shem? Yes. Did yes. One in the same person. One in the same oh, person. I'm sorry, I missed that. One in the How same person. How? How do we know that? Yeah. Well, Shem is still has 135 years to live in the time of Abram. And the last person to get the blessing in Genesis was Shem through Noah. And now we have it's like and now we have this royal priest king blessing Abram. So where does he get this blessing to bless from? Noah got his blessing from his birthright. How does how does Melchizedek get the blessing to bless Abram with? And and it, it may not seem as, as big of a deal to us because we're like, well, couldn't he have just blessed him because he was a nice guy? And, you know, I say, God bless you. I mean, does that mean I have to get my blessing from somewhere? Well, we're, we're getting this interpretation from early Jewish commentaries. This was what, this is the way that they read the Bible. This is a Hebrew worldview. And so, and it kind of shows how the narrative continues, how Shem 
uh, passes on this blessing to Abram. Yes? So, in order for Shem or anyone to pass a blessing on, are they about ready to die? Or, I mean, how, do they, how do they decide it's time? How do they decide it's time? To pass the blessing on? You know, I don't know. Um, the, the way that, the way that it, before the Levitical priesthood, the way that, that uh, familial authority, the priesthood in the, fa- in the family context was passed on was from father to son. Um, I know that the uh, um, I know that in, in some cases the the blessing was passed on right before death. Other times not. Like for instance, Ham wasn't near his death uh, when he. I mean, I'm sorry, Noah was not near his death when he blessed uh, the god of Shem, and then he cursed Canaan. It would just happen to be when after he had built a vineyard and he got drunk. The narrative doesn't say he was on his deathbed. So apparently he gave his blessing at that time. We'll see that when. Uh, later on, that when Jacob supplants Esau and fools his father, uh, Isaac, Isaac gives the blessing to Jacob and not to Esau, even though that Isaac loved Esau more and wanted to give the blessing to him, but there was a little little tomfoolery going on. And so we see the blessing being given, and the the blessing couldn't be taken back. I, I... Isaac couldn't take the blessing back from Jacob and give it to Esau. Once it had been given, it had been given. Um, and so, and he was, and it, he was so old. It, scripture says that Isaac was so old that he couldn't see. So you know, he was so poor of vision. And what, and Esau was really hairy. And it says that um, Rebecca, their mother, uh, wanted Jacob to get the blessing, so she dresses Jacob in like fur. And so he goes up and lets. You know, Isaac kind of feel his arm, and then he gives the blessing to Jacob, thinking that he's giving the blessing to Esau. Um, and so, with regard to age, I don't think that's really necessary. You have to be on your deathbed. But this is a way of passing on the covenantal authority. Who's going to be the head of the household and of the representative of the covenant? And so, the uh, biblical scholarship is showing us that before Levi... Yes? Sure, sure, go ahead. No, the no, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing is where God is working through the covenant, where the covenantal authority continues. The, basically, it's an authority that you have. Okay, so we're going to see later on when the blessing continues through the kings of Judah, they're going to have the covenantal authority. And if you break off from the kingdom of Judah, you you aren't in, you aren't you aren't doing what God wants you to do. He wants you. I, I, would, I would say that the people between Shem and Abram did have that authority, but that this is, that, that this is, uh, that this is a different way of recording history. Uh, that, he, that they're just showing that the blessing went to Abram. They're, the author is really trying to emphasize that. Now, it may be the case that they never got the blessing, that, yes, Abram is a descendant from Seth. I mean, I'm sorry, from Shem. But, and then Shem really did live to be that age, and he really did give the blessing directly to Abram and didn't give it to any of his children. But he gave it to his great, 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 great grandson. Yeah, this is not, this is not like divine communication. This is not, I'm, because I have the blessing, I can talk to God. That's not what that is. Rather, having the blessing is, is like authority. And you, and you get this authority from your father, not directly from God. It's happening through human mediators. Right, he did not. And that's an, that's an important point that you bring up, because actually that's the next point I'm going to make, is that God did not directly give the blessing to Shem. Okay? I mean, God, before the blessing was given through human mediators, it was given from father to son. And, and, and notice that, from father to son. You know, the father blesses the son. Or he'll curse the son. And the curse is, a, is redemptive. It's not purely punitive, but the punishment of the curse is meant for redemption. It's meant for good, eventually. And so, we have a, the father blesses the son or curses the son, and this is happening humans are blessing or cursing. And then with Abram, we don't just have his father, Terah, or just Shem blessing, but we have God himself 
blessing Abram. And so this shows that God is a father who's blessing his son, Abram, who he wants to bless the rest of his children, all the families of the earth, basically through Abram. So God wants to bless all of his children. He considers all the families of the earth his wayward children that he wants to bring back into line uh, under the covenant. And this is where we move into Genesis 15. So let's go ahead and turn to the beginning of Genesis 15. I'm, I'm skipping over some of Genesis here, some of the narrative. I'm, I'm passing over uh, the four kings, Abraham and Lot parting, Abraham and Sarai in Egypt. By the way, do you guys know Abram came from Ur of the Chaldeans, which was a very wealthy place, is where his family originally came from. And then he went forth to a land that God called him to go to. And there was a famine in the land, and he goes down to Egypt... He comes out of Egypt. He comes back to the land. His nephew Lot gets in dire straits. And Abram acts as the redeeming kinsman to kind of redeem Lot from this situation. And so he redeems Lot, gets him out of this situation. Do we, do we know of anybody else in salvation history who, came, who, who humbled himself and took the form of a slave, you know, came down from where he was rich? And went down to Egypt. As soon as he got to the promised land, he went right down to Egypt. And then he came back up. And then he ends up redeeming his kinsmen. Abram is a type of Christ. Christ comes down from heaven, goes to the promised land. He's born in Bethlehem. Almost immediately, he goes down into Egypt. He comes back and he redeems us through his Paschal mystery. So again, Abram is a type of Christ. Now, in Genesis 15... We have some time after these events, this word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. I will make your reward very great. But Abram said, O God, what good will your gifts be if I keep on being childless and have as my heir the steward of my house, Eleazar? Abram continued, See, you have given me no offspring, and so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Know that one shall not be your that one shall not be your heir. Your own issue, your own seed, your own son will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can. If you can. He only says it once, I'm just giving emphasis. Just so, he added, so shall your descendants be. Abram put his faith in the Lord who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. He then said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans. And this is where people say, you know, God did bring Abraham from the, or Abram from the Ur of the Chaldeans. Well, he did through his father Terah, but he really, the call began in Haran where he really, Haran where he really called him. To give you this land as a possession, this land as a possession, the land of Canaan, which shouldn't be Canaan's, it should be Shem's. O Lord God, he asked, how am I to know that I shall possess it? God answered him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, split them in two, and placed each half opposite the other. But the birds he did not cut up. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Abram stayed with them. As the sun was about to set, as the sun was about to set, A trance fell upon Abram, and a deep, terrifying darkness enveloped him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants shall be aliens in a land not their own, where they shall be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they must serve, and in the end they will depart with great wealth. You, however, shall join your forefathers in peace. You shall be buried at a contented old age. In the fourth time span, the others shall come back here. The wickedness of the Amorites will not have reached its full measure until then. When the sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking brazier and a flaming torch which passed between those pieces. It was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant, a berit, with Abram, saying to your descendants, and the Hebrew is 
zera, which mean, literally means seed. To your seed, I give this land. From the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. <sighs> okay, now, what did we learn from the emphasis I laid upon Scripture? When God commanded Abram to look up at the sky and to count the stars, how many stars did Abram count? It hadn't gotten dark yet. That's right. It didn't even get dark. It was still day. So what kind of faith would you need to see the stars if you can't even see the stars? See, there's more, there's more in the text than what you readily see on first glance. The first time this was pointed out to me, I said, what are you talking about? I didn't say that. I looked back at it, and I was oh my gosh, it does. Okay. And how many stars did Abram see? One. The sun. Right? So, Abram sees one star, the sun, and God says, you know, count the stars, how many descendants you'll see. And Abram only saw one of his, you know, figuratively speaking, um, he saw one of his sons, he saw Isaac. He didn't get to see all of the billions of sons that he would end up having, especially in the New Covenant. But he saw Isaac. And by faith, Abram knew that God was going to bless him through Isaac. And so Abram had this great faith. And it says, Abram put his faith in the Lord who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. Abram had this great faith. And this is what pleased God. And this is very important because later on Paul, in the epistle to the Galatians, is going to refer back to this text as an argument against those people who say that you must be circumcised when you're a Christian to be saved. And Paul will say, no. Let's go back to Genesis 15, 6. Abram put his faith in the Lord who credited to him as an act of righteousness. Is Abram circumcised now? No. Is Abram pleasing in the sight of the Lord through faith? Yes. But circumcision is not there. And this is why we have Paul making this argument in Galatians, back to this verse, is that Abram was justified before the Lord. He, he, was, he had a right relationship with the Lord without ever being circumcised. And this is going to be very important for, for Paul. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to start here with, the, with Genesis 15. And gen, in Genesis 15, this covenant, this berit, is made with Abram. And the nature of the covenant making, by the way, when, they, when it says that you would enter into a covenant, it would say you would cut a covenant. And that comes from the, the, the sense of cutting the animals, that through the, the sacrificial animal, you're establishing this covenant. And so you're cutting the animals, so you're cutting the covenant. And we see that the animals were cut in half, right? And so this is like a covenant oath. God is... God himself is going in the, in the smoking brazier and the flaming torch is going between the animals saying, if I transgress my covenant, let, let what, what happened to these animals happen to me. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, chop me in half, you know, pour salt in my bleeding wounds. Let me you know, be cursed, basically, if I transgress this covenant. Now, God doesn't have to do this. God already promised. That's, that's all we should have. I mean, we don't need a covenant beyond God's promise. And, we, and Hebrews 6, which we covered in an earlier session, talks about how God's covenant is just God just loving even more. He's just saying, guys, look, you can trust me, really. And so we have this covenant made with Abram, and we have animal pieces in part of the covenant cutting process. Covenant pieces. We also have a darkness enveloping Abram, Let me see here. Where is the darkness? Verse 12. A deep, terrifying darkness enveloped him. So we have this darkness. And there's, there's terror. We also have um, smoke and fire. 
smoke and fire. So we're having a barbecue. And this will eventually foreshadow um, uh, Independence Day barbecues. Uh, and then we have a prophecy of Egyptian slavery. By the way, you guys should go to go go over to uh, A and M to like the Lupo's bookstore, and they have those really cool Aggie uh, seat cushions. I really recommend those. So we have a prophecy of Egyptian slavery. And notice, not just the promised land, but all of Arabia is promised. All of Arabia. This, at the end of chapter 15, uh, f- uh, from the Wadi of Egypt, I mean, from the Wadi of Egypt, way down at the Wadi of Egypt, all the way to the Euphrates. I mean, this is, this is a huge land that's, that's being promised. And we see this especially being fulfilled when we have Israel wandering in Arabia. Okay? Israel is, is in this land, but not, but not fully. It hasn't gotten to, to the, basically the center of this land, the, the, the land of Canaan, which it's eventually going to aim towards. And this covenant will be fulfilled in the person of Moses. And when, Moses form, when God forms a, a covenant with Moses... At Mount Sinai, uh, part of the Mosaic Covenant is animal sacrifice. This is a big part of it. Uh, at Mount Sinai, darkness, there's darkness and terror. The Israelites are afraid to climb Mount Sinai because they didn't purify themselves. Actually, they didn't abstain from sexual relations as they were supposed to, as God had commanded them. They couldn't hold themselves back. And so uh, we'll see more about that when we get into it. Uh, smoke and fire envelop uh, Mount Sinai. And... Right before Sinai, they're in Egyptian slavery for 400 years. So this covenant made with Abram uh, is, going to be, is, is basically making a covenant out of the first promise, land and nationhood. And through Moses, uh, Israel is going to become a nation. This is going to be the covenant at Mount Sinai is what this covenant points to. And so you, Israel is going to become a nation. Worship is going to be centered upon the tabernacle, which is a, a, the tent of the nomadic people, and Torah is going to be the law of the covenant, the first five books, the Torah. Remember the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nebim, the Ketuvim? And then let's go ahead and see here. Now, between this covenant and the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17, a big event occurs. Does Abram continue in his faith? And does he, you know, wait for Sarai to have a son? No. no. Rather, she actually, at her prompting, he goes into his Egyptian concubine or maidservant, Hagar, and bears, and, she, and Hagar has the son of Ishmael. Ishmael, through Hagar. And for you guys in the back who can't read this, uh, the doctor is up here. Okay, He'll give you his card afterwards. And I'm going to keep writing. He, he asked me before the study to write smaller and smaller. <laughs> so, so don't blame me. Okay. And then, so basically, he uh, does not, uh, he does not adhere to God's promise, but he goes ahead and tries to, you know, go through a loophole and say, aha, I'm going to have an heir through Hagar, as I can't possibly have an heir through Sarai. Now notice that Hagar is an Egyptian, and Abram has already been to Egypt, and he brought Hagar out, and now he's kind of going around God's covenant by using this Egyptian concubine. Now later on in history, one of Abram's descendants, or actually a whole slew of them, are going to go down to Egypt, and they're going to depart Egypt with wealth, just like Abram did, and then they're going, to, they're going to still have Egypt stuck on their hearts. Okay? The life of Abram is, go, is kind of like a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to Israel. Okay, so now we go to, let's go to verse 15 at the end of 16. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named the son whom Hagar bore him Ishmael, Ishmael which means God has heard. Abram was 86 years old 
when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Okay, Abram was 86. And then we skip one verse to verse 1, and it says when Abram was 99. So 13 years went by. Boom. Like, it's like those movies, you know, when, when the, the scene kind of fades out and it says 13 years later. You know, this, this is what's happening here. And notice that Ishmael is 13 years old when the narrative picks up. When Abram was 99 years old, chapter 17, verse 1, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God the Almighty. Walk in my presence and be blameless. Okay, has Abram been walking in God's pre- presence and being blameless? No, this is like a, you know, this is almost like a judgment. God's saying, come on, walk in my presence, be blameless, you know. Between you and me, I will establish my berit. I will establish my covenant. And I will multiply you exceedingly. Now, what does Abram's name mean? Abram. Exalted father. Exalted father. When Abram prostrated himself, God continued to speak to him. My covenant with you is this. You are to become the father of a host of nations. No longer shall you be called Abram, your name shall be called Abraham, for I'm making you the father of a host of nations. What does Abraham mean? Father of a, of a great multitude. So he goes from being an exalted father to being a father of a great multitude. And we'll see this fulfilled in the next covenant, that the covenant in Genesis 17 will point to. I will render you exceedingly fertile. I will make nations of you. Kings shall stem from you. Okay, so we have kings will stem from you. I will maintain my covenant, my berit, with you and your descendants after you throughout the ages as an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are now staying. The whole land of Canaan. So we have Canaan being promised. Narrows it down a little bit more. As a permanent possession, and I will be their God. Verse, 19, verse 9. God also said to Abram, to Abraham, now we're at Abraham, and this covenant now is being made with Abraham, not just Abram. Okay, God's, God also said to Abraham, on your part, you and your descendants after you must keep my covenant throughout the ages. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you that you must keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Okay, circumcised. So the, this covenant that comes right after Genesis 16 is, I misspelled circumcised, didn't I? Circumcised, it has an S, not a Z. Look at me. Okay, so the, the punishment kind of fits the crime. You know, Abram was unfaithful. He didn't stay in this faith. And he commits this kind of lack of, this lack of faith. And so he gets circumcised. And circumcision is kind of like uh, the symbol of having a hard heart. Uh, this is kind of Jewish thought that before you're circumcised, it's kind of like, and circumcision is like, you know, getting off, getting, off the, the fl- getting off the old flesh. And kind of like newness comes from that. And we'll see St. Paul pick this up in Colossians when he teaches about baptism. Okay. Circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, verse 11, that you, and that shall be the mark of the covenant between you and me. So this is also known as the covenant of circumcision. Throughout the ages, every male among you, when he is eight days old, shall be circumcised. By the way, this is why there's a venerable ancient tradition of Christians baptizing their children on the eighth day. And the early church, in the early church, Christians picked this up from circumcision on the eighth day. Including houseborn slaves and those acquired with money from any foreigner who is not of your blood. Yes, both the houseborn slaves and those acquired with money must be circumcised. Thus, my covenant shall be in your flesh, in your flesh, as an everlasting 
covenant. If a male is uncircumcised, that is, if the flesh of his foreskin has not been cut away, such a one shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, this is, in a certain sense, kind of the covenant oath by which you enter into the old covenant for men, anyhow. And it's so serious that if, if you don't do it, you're, in tr- you're kind of in trouble. And we'll see Moses with a vi- one of his own sons. He forgets to circumcise him. And uh, God almost strikes Moses dead on the spot. But we'll get to that. God further said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai. Her name shall be Sarah. I will bless her, and I will give you a son by her. Him also will I bless. He shall give rise to nations, and rulers of peoples shall issue from him. Okay, Sarai and Sarah are different versions of, of about the same name. And they mean, uh, they, they indicate royalty among a woman, like a princess or a queen. Okay, this is kind of the, and uh, uh, the most prevalent interpretation I've seen is princess. So if you want to name your daughter princess, go right on ahead, name her Sarah. Okay, and then... Abram said to God, let but, this is verse 18, I'm skipping a verse. Then Abraham said to God, let but Ishmael live in your favor. Come on God, look, I procured an heir through Hagar, what about him? Let him live in your favor. God replied, nevertheless, your wife Sarah is to bear you a son, and you shall call him Isaac. Okay, because in verse 17, Abraham prostrated himself and laughed and said, can a man be born can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Or can Sarah give birth at 90? So he laughs. So Isaac's name means he laughs. Okay, and then verse uh, 20. As for Ishmael, I am heeding you. I, w- I hereby bless him. I will make him fertile and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 chieftains. And I will make of him a great nation. But my covenant I will maintain with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you by this time next year. Okay? Are any of you in the medical field? Okay. You guys ever see babies getting circumcised in the medical field at all? Actually, Gloria here worked in the, was it you who worked in the same hospital when I was born? Hillcrest Baptist Hospital in January of 1979. Gloria was working in surgery? In surgery when I was born there. Really, really odd. It's a small world. Small world, man. Texas. Gosh, we're just a bunch of inbreeds. We all live in the same place. and So, so here we have, uh, so Isaac's supposed to be born in one year, and God says, get circumcised now. So Abraham's thinking here, he's saying, okay, I'm, she's going to have a son through me in one year, and I have to get circumcised right now? I mean, you have three months, buddy, to gear up, I mean, to, to basically get over your wounds. And then notice in verse 25, I'm skipping down a little bit, verse 25, And his son Ishmael was 13 years old, remember 13, 13 years old, when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. Now, among Israel, Israelis and Arabs, Arabs circumcise at 13 years old. They're real manly. You know, it's a rite of passage. It's like their quinceanera, or, you know, their bar, what's a, a bar mitzvah would be the guy, right? It's like their bar mitzvah. Not the bat mitzvah, but the bar mitzvah. Ah, we're going to circumcise you at age 13. But the Israelites were a little bit more merciful. They did it on the eighth day. So, and notice here that we have infants entering into the covenant with no, I mean, they didn't have anything to do with this. On the eighth day, their parents choose it for them. And in the New Testament, we'll see Paul saying that baptism is the circumcision of the new covenant. And the early church fathers would point to this and they would say, see, St. Paul uh, he's talking about baptism being a new circumcision, and pr- pretty much all Israelites were circumcised on the eighth day. It never happened beyond that because you were always circumcised by your parents unless if you were a God-fearer and then you became an Israelite. And you're really fearing God before you become an Israelite because that's why you're known as a God-fearer, I guess, because you're really fearing God because you have something to fear, right? Okay, you guys aren't kidding this. Okay, so we have kings will issue from Sarah. We have circumcision the land of Canaan being given. And here we have a foreshadowing of the covenant that's going to be made in 2 Samuel 7 with David and with David's son, Solomon. And 
under David and Solomon, the, the kingdom, the structure is going to be not a nation, but a kingdom. And the worship is going to be centered not around a nomadic tabernacle like a tent that you can pick, that the Levites pick up and carry to the next destination, but rather it's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem. And the, 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 the law of the covenant is going to be the wisdom literature. The Psalms are going to be the, the hymnal for the temple. Okay, the wisdom literature in Jewish tradition emanates from Solomon. And the wisdom literature is very all-encompassing. It talks about, the Psalms talk about all the nations. Okay, they, they include, it's, it's more Catholic. It includes more than just Israel. Whereas the first five books pertain, you know, just to Israel. Leviticus is just for the Levitical priests and the Holiness Code for the rest of the people of Israel. And this is very nationalistic, whereas this becomes more uh, kingdom-like, not so much nationalistic. And then... We're going to read in Genesis 22 of the third covenant that God makes with Abraham. Now again, this second covenant, Genesis 17, is a fulfillment of the second promise in Genesis 12, uh, verse 2. And that promise was, I will make your shem great. Okay, I will make a dynasty for you. I will make a kingdom for you. And so, yes. Genesis 17 reminds you of Adam and Eve in the temptation. Of the, you know, the, Eve giving Adam the apple, Sarah gives Abram. Sarah gives Hagar to, to Abram. And you know what? I'll bet you that that's not just coincidence. I'll bet you that's part of the narrative. Is that, is that it just as Noah committed kind of the same kind of sin as Adam did, Noah got, basically got drunk from the fruit of the, the vine, so Ab- uh, Adam got drunk basically ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so Abram, or Ab- yeah, Abram kind of eats the fruit of, you know, he's not supposed to have. Yeah, that's very, that's a great insight. That's really good. At least he gets it this time, not the woman. At least he gets it and not the woman. Yeah. You know, Eve got labor and he got circumcised. Eve got labor and she got, he got circumcised. So, you know, there's, there, there's, there's pain for both parties here. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn. We have Genesis 18. We have Abraham entertaining visitors. And I love verse 15 of uh, chapter 18. Verse 15 of chapter 18. Because she was afraid, Sarah dissembled, saying, I I didn't laugh, but he said, yes, you did. (laughs) And I just love that verse. It's just like, stick it to you. Okay, so Abraham intercedes for Sodom. Uh, cha- chapter 19, we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have the, uh, a story explaining the origin of the Moabites and the Ammonites in uh, chapter 19, starting with verse 30. And then we have chapter 20, Abraham at Gerar. 21, we have the birth of Isaac. So a year has passed, and we have the birth of Isaac. So it says in verse 3 of chapter 21, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son of whom Sarah bore him. Okay, Ch- uh, Verse 12 of chapter 21, But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed about the boy or about your slave woman. Heed the demands of Sarah, no matter what she is asking of you. For it is through Isaac, again, God emphasizes through Isaac, that descendants shall bear your name. Okay, We have the... Uh, we have uh, in verse uh, 22 and on, in, in chapter 21, we have the, the pact or the covenant at Be'er Shiva, which we covered in a previous study session where we talked about the covenant between Abimelech and Abraham, the seven ewe lambs. It's the covenant of seven or it's the covenant of oath. It's the Be'er Shiva covenant and uh, oath and seven are like the same word, Shiva. And now we get to chapter 22. And this is, this, is, uh, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the Old Testament, I think. I think it's just absolutely amazing because it's such a foreshadowing of the New Covenant. Ooh, I just gave it away. So, and this covenant's going to be made with Abraham's Zerah, or his seed. The Hebrew word is Zerah. You can put an H here just to for linguistic purposes. And so this is where the third promise in Genesis 12, 
uh, 3, uh, that worldwide blessing is going to happen through Abra, Abram, and now Abraham's descendants. Okay, verse 1 of chapter 22. Sometime after these events, God put Abraham to the test. He called to him, Abraham, ready, he replied. Then God said, take your son Isaac, your only one. Not Ishmael, but your only son. Now, Abraham has two sons, but God's saying your only son, because this is the only one the covenant's going to be happening through. So we have an only son. Okay. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a holocaust on the height that I will point out to you. So early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him his son Isaac and two of his servants as well, and with the wood that he had cut for the holocaust, set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, so we have the third day, Abraham got sight of the place from afar. Then he said to his servants, both, you, both of you stay here with the donkey. While the boy and I go over yonder, we will worship and then come back to you. Thereupon, Abraham took the wood for the Holocaust and laid it on his son Isaac's shoulders because Abraham's too old to carry the wood. So we have this young, strapping man, Isaac, carrying the wood up this mountain in the land of Moriah. Okay. And laid it on his son's Isaac's shoulders, this is in verse 6, while he himself carried the fire in the knife. As the two walked on together, Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham. Father, he said. Yes, son, he replied. Isaac continued, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the Holocaust? Son, Abraham answered, God himself will provide. Okay, and the Hebrew there is uh, Yehovah Yireh. Okay, God will see to it, or God will provide. Then the two continued going forward. When they came, actually, I'm sorry, uh, Jehovah Yireh actually isn't in that verse. It's actually going to be in verse 14. Uh, there's a different verb used uh, for in verse 8. Don't let me confuse you. Verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next he tied up his son Isaac and put him on top of the wood on the altar. And so this event is known as the Akedah among Jews because it's the binding. That's Hebrew for the binding of Isaac. Isaac allows for himself to be bound to the altar. So Isaac is, is a, he's involved in this uh, willingly in this event. Then he reached out, this is in verse 10, and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the Lord's messenger called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Lord, he answered. Do not lay your hand on the boy, said the messenger. Do not do the least thing to him. I know how devoted you are to God, since you did not withhold from me your own beloved son. Okay, so not is he the only son, but he's beloved. He's an only beloved son. As Abraham looked about, he spied a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. The thicket is where the lamb was. And he offered it up as a holocaust in place of his son. Abraham named the site Yahweh Yireh. Hence, people now say, on the mountain, the Lord will see to it, or the Lord will provide. Again, the Lord's messenger called to Abraham from heaven and said, I swear by myself. Again, here's the covenant oath that affects the covenant. You have to, in order to have a covenant, you have to have the oath. I swear by myself. Is God, what is God going to swear by? You know, uh, Hercules or Zeus? No, he's going to swear by himself declares the Lord, that because you acted as you did in not withholding from me your beloved son, I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants shall take possession of the gates of their enemies, and in your descendants all the nations of the earth shall find blessing. All this because you obeyed my command. So we have worldwide blessing, Catholic blessing, not just national blessing. 
or, or just, you know, a national kingdom type blessing, but this is going to be worldwide. All the families, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so we have the faithful father. We have a- Abra- Abraham is being faithful to God. He's being a father who's faithful. And we have this holocaust on Moriah, and we have the third day mentioned. Uh, Isaac is bound to the wood. The thicket, kind of, you know, the ram is kind of caught in the thicket. We almost kind of have a, an imagery of, like, thorns, kind of keeping the ram in this thicket. Okay, so we have thorns, and we have worldwide blessing. Here we have a pre-enactment of the new covenant. We have God the Father, the faithful Father, offering his only beloved son, who right before he's offered, he is crowned with the crowning of the thorns, He's bound to the wood of the cross. He carries his own cross up Calvary. And guess where Calvary is? It's in the land of Moriah. Let me see if I have the, uh, the verse here. If I wrote it down. It's in First Chronicles. Actually, I have it written down here in my Bible. This is where it is. It's in Moriah is... In First Chronicles, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles three one. In Second Chronicles three one, we learn that Solomon built the temple in the land of Moriah. On one of the on one of the hills of Moriah, and so here's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in the land of Moriah. Calvary is right outside of the of the gates of Jerusalem, on one of those hills, and so we have Calvary is one of the hills actually in the land of Moriah. So this, again, is, I mean, just the imagery is just popping out, you see? This is how Jesus could say to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, how he explained to them that he was all over the Old Testament. We've seen him all over, I mean, we saw him in Noah, we saw him in Adam, we saw him in Abel, we saw him in Abraham, now we're seeing him in Isaac, we're seeing him in this whole, I mean, we're going to continue to see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. And so here, what we have here is we have a map, we have a blueprint for the rest of the Bible. We're going to have salvation history going through Moses, and then eventually through King David, and right up into Jesus, and on through into the church age. And salvation history right now is still going forward. It hasn't ended yet. Okay, now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And those of you who have the, the Bible tabs are just going to be right there. And so put your, put your siblings to shame and uh, tell them that they need to get those Bible tabs. Hebrews 11, verse 17. Hebrews 11, verse 17. Barbara, would you please read verses 17 and 18? By faith Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was ready to offer his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac's descendants shall bear your name. He reasoned that God was able to raise even from the dead and he received Isaac back as a symbol. By faith regarding things still to come, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So Hebrews tells us that Abraham was expecting somehow for his son to be raised from the dead. Now, is the author of Hebrews just, you know, putting words in the mouth of Moses, you know, or whoever wrote Genesis? Is, he, is maybe the author of Hebrews going too far and reading the resurrection back into this event? I, wouldn't, I would say not. I would say that the, the author of the Hebrews is right in line by saying that Abraham, uh, by faith, expected to receive his son back in the resurrection. And this is a, this is a shadow of, of things to come. Because God said, I mean, how many times did God said through Isaac, your only son, through Isaac, through Isaac, through Isaac, not through Ishmael, through Isaac. No, 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 not through Ishmael, through Isaac. And then God says, 
kill Isaac. I mean, what's Abraham to think? God can't go against his promise. He certainly can't go against his covenant. And now he wants me to kill the only one through whom we're going to have kings being issued and a nation growing up and worldwide blessing, and now you want me to kill him? I mean, the, the only explanation I could find is if Abraham, somehow Isaac, were to be raised from the dead. But he's still obeying him by sacrificing him. But still, you have to have faith in the resurrection. I mean, you got to have the faith that the resurrection is going to happen. You know, that's still faith. I mean, I mean, if 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 someone, I mean, if if God were to say to me, "Okay, Carson, I want you to go slay your wife right now," and he doesn't say anything about the resurrection, he just says it that we're going to have an heir through my wife, and he says, "Go slay her." And so I kind of infer that, that from that that there might be a resurrection. I mean, that's still a lot of faith. That's still saying, okay, I, I, I'm thinking that possibly there's going to be a resurrection. Okay, where's the angel? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's still a lot of faith. It's still the, the obedience that happens. And also what's really interesting is that other pagan gods demanded child sacrifice. And we'll find out later on in the life of Israel that Israelites actually succumb to this, and they actually end up, some Israelites actually end up offering their children to, in sacrifice to these pagan gods because they, they basically take on this idolatry. And so, th- in a certain sense, this is God saying, uh-uh, I'm not like these other gods who demand child sacrifice. You may have thought so for a moment, but uh-uh. Rather, I'm a God of love. And so let's go ahead and close in prayer since we've, we've hit the 8.30. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you are faithful. You are faithful. And we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for a God who is so generous, who is so trustworthy. And so with great awe and great thankfulness, I just thank you. I thank you for these these scripture verses, for these passages that really confirm my own faith, that really help me see what you did in Jesus and what your plan is for us as Christians. And so I just offer you so much thanks. I also ask that as we depart from this place this evening that we would go forth from this study tonight with a greater appreciation of your love. May we reflect that love in our lives. May we follow Abraham, our father in faith. May we offer our lives to you in self-sacrifice. But we know, Lord, we cannot do this without your grace. So we ask for that grace. We praise you and we bless you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.